Welcome to Command Control Power, a weekly podcast hosted by three certified members of the Apple Consultants Network, drawing from over half a century of combined experience. We talk shop, interview vendors and colleagues, and share what we've learned while operating our technology consulting practices. This is Joe Sapinari of Cymac, and my two co-hosts are Jerry Zygmunt of MacWorks and Sam Valencia of the HCS Technology Group. For the freshest content, a peek behind the scenes, and more candid conversation about running our businesses, dealing with clients, fixing tough technical issues, and everything else you love about command control power, we invite you to join us on Patreon so you don't miss any of this great content. Go to commandcontrolpower.com and click support. Pledge monthly, and you can instantly subscribe to the patron-only shows right in your favorite podcast app. Once again, to join us on Patreon and get the latest patron-only episodes, visit commandcontrolpower.com and click support. We hope to see you there, and thanks for listening. Welcome back to Command Control Power. Adam Angst of Tidbits Content Network. Thanks again for joining us, Adam. Oh, love to be here. It's been a little while, and we were talking again about how that fast-forward button got pressed at some point during COVID, and it seems like it's still being held down. Everything keeps going by more quickly, but I think it has been a little while since you've been on the show, and we wanted to talk to you about an article that you had sent out that got some traction that I thought was really interesting, this annotated field guide to identifying phishing emails. Yeah. yeah and it's a, now it's included also, a uh, version of this article is included in the content that we get as subscribers to Tidbit's content network. So everybody out there has seen this by now because it just came out today as we record, but it's really great, valuable content that you can send out to your clients to help them understand like how to notice what's wrong with these emails that they seem to forward us blindly and say, is this legit? They just <laughs> always ask. And it's obviously not. A lot of the times I just want to say, obviously not, <laughs> but it's just too many times they're asking. So do you want to take us through some of the key features that you can distill this down for us to say, these are the number one red flags that people seem to be able to wrap their head around from this article? Yeah. So just real quickly, where I got started with this stuff is a number of phishing messages started to slip through Gmail's filter. And so I'm seeing these in my inbox and going, what's going on here? And then I looked at them just a tad bit more carefully. The entire message was an image. And so it was text. It looked, it was basically someone taking a screenshot of what they wanted to look like. And all it was trying to do was to get you to click anywhere on the image. And that doesn't look really wrong because you can obviously take a screenshot of a perfectly normal looking message, but it does look wrong in that there's always an attachment icon and it, it might be squished a little or not show up in the, in the body of the message quite the way you'd expect. It might be like slammed up in the upper left hand corner or something like that or it doesn't and respect so, your dark mode setting or precisely yeah. it was just like what's going on and it really wasn't until three or four of these had come through that i realized oh wow this is a new technique for avoiding the spam filters right. and because what spam filter is going to say a message with a single image is spam like right. how do you know it has to look at the image and see what the image right. is trying to tell people, right. which getting close to the point where they could do that at scale and, and not yeah. not overwhelm the uh, the OCR process or whatever. But maybe we're not quite there yet. Yeah, certainly. And I think it's certainly new enough that it's not standard across the board. So anyway, so yeah, so I picked, I picked one of those. And then I'm like, I got to tell people about this because this is new. And it's even if it's getting past the spam filter, you're even more likely to fall prey. Who knows? I mean, I don't know what you guys, your AML looks like mine. The spam filter is just capturing tons and tons of stuff. But then I went and looked at more and more of these and they've gotten better. I think they used to be really egregious and it was intentional in some ways because it's a little bit like the Nigerian spam where if they're going to try to scam you out of your bank account, they need someone who's pretty gullible. Right. So it's no, there's no, no win in making it really clever because then you just get clever people who are gonna, who are gonna fall for it. With these, all they really want to do is get you to log into an account somewhere. Of course, it's not really account; it's them stealing your password and, and login. And once I realized all of that, I started looking at the real details. And biggest thing after the image that I discovered was they've gotten really good at buttons. And because you think about it, like when you're scanning something quickly, if there's a button. 
the call right. to action. It's the same way you write a effective newsletter to send to your clients. You want a really clear, obvious call to action. Like, click this button to to find out more about whatever it is. And yeah, and in this are, case, it's so click here to fix your password problems <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. I, in fact, I'm looking at one of them. It's like a reconfirm password, revalidate yeah. account. Right. Wow. Okay. I want to do one of those things. Sounds I mean, vaguely <laughs> technical. I, this is probably the right thing to do. It's yeah. going to be annoying, but I better do it. Yeah. So that was the second thing. And that's when I really started to dive in and go, okay, I need to explain some of these. The format I came up with was taking a screenshot and then putting in little red number circles and then explaining what I saw next to each one of them. Because some of this is expert knowledge. One of the ones that actually is in the TCN content this month, I was actually really perturbed by because it's really good. It's the one that it purports to be a telling you that your email account has been compromised and that you should reset your password. And it, and even, it just it mentions Moscow. It's, right. Oh no, like it's a red flag for people. They're like, oh, that, that's not me. Oh no, that's a scam. I better click and get and, take care of this. Yeah. And the only huge mistake that one makes is it purports to give you the IP number from which the compromise came from. Mm. But it's five sets of digits, That's, and one yeah. of them is 719. Like, yeah, which is not a thing, yeah. But to give you yeah. an idea, it took me, like, the third time I looked at it to see that problem. You know, that, yes, that's painfully obvious. And actually, I saw the 719 first, and I'm like, oh, that can't be an IP address. And it wasn't until I looked even harder that I realized there were five sets of digits. So, you know, like, if someone who is, like, documenting this for the purpose of an article doesn't see this on the first try or two... Yep. Can someone who's just skimming? No, not a chance. And so that's what trying to just get people. And so one of the big pieces of advice also is be careful of simple ones, that they actually are in some ways more dangerous because there's less to go wrong. It, we all get email messages saying, oh, your password was compromised, things like that from have I been pwned or one password or whatever. Not uncommon. And to get something like that, oh, click through. Again, super easy thing to imagine someone doing, even if you just tell them, don't do it, don't do it. <laughs> Never, yeah. ever click. Yeah, it's tricky. And you're calling attention to something as arcane as an IP address as a red flag for people in, like us in tech. That we, like yeah. we should be able to notice that. And sometimes even that takes a few tries. A client is hopeless to recognize a valid IP address or most of these red flags, other than the fact that I think one thing that we still have going for us is the grammar issue. I thought it was really interesting how you mentioned in your article, nothing prevents fishers from writing correct English, but it seldom happens. And that's, <laughs> I think we're very lucky that's the case. And a lot of times they really come off as non-native speakers as opposed to maybe they're writing in English, but not thinking in English, as you mentioned yeah. in the article. Now, I wonder about that though. So I've always thought it's going to be the end times when spammers just start to hire native English speakers and a copy editor and a designer. Yeah. But I was wondering recently if it's in fact that the email layout has to be bad to avoid the junk filters or the English has to be bad with random spaces inserted inside of words or like the wrong letter, like a zero instead of an O in order to trip the spam filters. Do you think that part is necessary still? I don't think so. And the reason is just that the spam filters are not really going to be looking for straight text because that's a really dangerous thing to look on. And I deal with this on a regular basis because of sending out an email newsletter. And so it does happen. But for something that's using relatively generic words, the spam filters aren't going to go after it. Because yeah. they won't know. But what about brands and things or trademarks? So, it's ah, like a, so that's it, a different issue. Okay. Yep. So, so they're... In fact, and I've seen this happen, one of my examples in the TCN is actually a DocuSign request. And all they did was take a DocuSign email and change the code under it. So that one, and actually the other ones that I found, and I mentioned the Tibbetts article, which are a little bit different, they're PayPal phishing spam. Yeah, scams. that's even more interesting yeah. that it's actually and sent by PayPal. Sent by PayPal. I've been and getting so, those myself lately, actually. Yeah. yeah. Those are totally, quote unquote, legit. And, and to your point in the article, your advice is don't mark them as spam because you don't want to miss a valid PayPal email. So yeah, it's just yeah, such precisely. catch 22. Yeah. So it's right. All I can say is that like, I'm a publisher. I'm a word person. I think this way. And so if I was doing a phishing email, it would be perfect. 
right. because I have those skills. And I'm better at English than most people, too, because of what I do for a living. And all I have to assume is that, particularly after you get down to people who no, English isn't their native language, there's just no hope. They simply don't have any idea what they're doing. Okay, but it can't be the case that no native English speakers are trying to scam people, and or at least nope. halfway decent native English speakers. Yeah, that would seem to be the case, but yeah, I just, I will admit, I just don't see it. Just, I, I wonder, again, if, if like, better grammar and, like, better layouts somehow, like, work against these scammers? Is there something about certainly inserting, like, valid trademarked words should flag it's like if it says we're from google and we need you to click here to reset your password if it's not from google.com like that yeah. would clearly trip up a spam filter yeah. but if it says google with a zero in it then maybe it would get through possibly the only thing i can say think about criminals in general right crime doesn't pay because most criminals aren't very good at it but there are people who are very good criminals and they don't get caught <laughs> or they don't get caught very often and you never hear about them but they exist and but there's not very many of them i think it's the same thing that like the money probably just isn't there in fishing to to really do a lot of it and be you know, like if you're really really good would you make that much money and probably the answer is no you could probably make more money using those skills in some legitimate way yeah so, i think you're also speaking to the idea that a lot of these scams originate in Economies that you yeah. know, where going like rate for a, any kind 25 of twenty five bucks, yeah, it's, it's just tiny by comparison. So there's like some leverage there for someone to run a decent you know scam. They can get ahead in that economy, not here. Yeah, and that's why so, you see some of the viruses coming from Eastern Europe and places where you've got very smart programmers and who can't get great jobs. So you're basically saying, even though there's not a lot of money in it in terms of our dollars. Those, we'll say the Eastern European countries and countries with the economy that scale better for that, they're still going to be at this game, which means the English is still going to be poor, which means they're still going to, like, I, I see this circle just continuing to happen. No yep. native English speakers will make good money off of this, so we'll still see poor grammar <laughs> and all of this moving forward. <laughs> yeah, I, and I do have to say, and I don't know if I'm making baseless assumptions here, but... Again, speaking as someone who just absorbs language and uh, completely natively, I would say that most of these are from Asia. The types of mistakes don't sound European to me. Um, there's different types of grammatical mistakes that you see from people who speak kind of romanced German Germanic languages, those that part of the world. Whereas the Asian languages tend to make different kinds of mistakes. And I can't, I couldn't even give you an example. I'm just saying this is my impression as something that that at a gut level I feel. And again, but it doesn't take much to be from Vietnam or Thailand or China or whatnot. And this is a way to make some money. Yeah. I wonder, I start thinking about solutions here too. Is there any hope in training user and individual people to understand this stuff and to parse it quickly enough? Because again, like you said, we're all flying through email, like many emails per day, even just the ones that slip through the spam filters, they sometimes catch us in a moment when we're tired and we've already looked at a hundred emails and, and we just click the button because it has a clear call to action and we fall prey to it. Clients, it, probably even more so, the threshold is even lower for them to fall into these traps. Can articles like yours train them effectively is there some hope in doing that or and or is it really more the responsibility of the vendors you called attention to the fact that your email client at one point showed your own avatar like your icon yes. your image as if the email had actually come from you just because of the spooked from header your mail <laughs> client should be able to figure that out i would think or like don't just lazy match the from address if it's not legitimate if i don't know if it yeah. doesn't have the right s FP or what? SPF, what yeah, SPF, SPF and DCAM, you know, yeah, and DCAM. Obviously, they should be working on those kinds of signals, but it's not perfect, and it's totally an arms race. I have to assume that it's so cheap to send this stuff that they're just going to keep slamming it out. And actually, one of the things I discovered was with a number of these, I actually get multiple ones from clearly the same people. Yeah, you know, they're just refining. I don't know if they're necessarily making it better each time, but they're definitely changing things in an in effort to see what works a better. A, a B testing across <laughs> the people or something. Yeah. 
yeah. for sure. But I, again, like the mail client should really fix this stuff. So it should it should certainly not show like your that just adds legitimacy where there shouldn't be any. Yeah, that it shows your yeah. icon there. And likewise, if it's like supposedly from someone that you know, also it I, I would say so. It can use the name only. This would be my advice to anybody making a mail client if it's from a person and the DKIM or SPF or whatever and or SPF matches then just show their name from your contacts but if or maybe like an icon that would say it's their name and it shows like Gmail or iCloud like it tells you which address it is so it's not showing the full thing but if it can't validate that and it's just it's whatever the from name says display the whole thing display the from email address as well as the name because otherwise it's just going to say from Apple even though it's c123xyz.com yeah yeah i mean you're absolutely right that obviously more can be done all the time with these kinds of things i think the problem that the clients run into and this is easier on the website for the gmails of the world is that it's a lot to build into code so if you're actually shipping an app it's a little bit trickier to do things like that that are perhaps not they might need to be a little bit more hard coded but that said i do think that people can be better at identifying it and Often the tricks are not that hard to teach. And, I had, and that was partly why I wanted to write these articles because it just takes that beat longer to look at something. One of the examples, it's supposedly a password expiration message. And right under the maintain current password button, it says, see full terms and conditions. And I'm like, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> what terms and conditions are there for my password expiring? <laughs> like, and then the next line is copyright. Who copyrights a message like this? Yeah. And then, of course, it's copyright 2023 email server. This sounds like so, backspace. <laughs> yes. So it really feels like one of those things where like someone who doesn't speak English was just like copying and pasting likely looking text yeah, from something else. Exactly. Oh, people click on terms and conditions. Let's click, put that in. Yeah. So it just it's a little bit of that idea that if you can just look long enough to let the it is not long it's just like a, an extra second or two to let the wrongness filter into your brain this is the idea that i was just thinking is it would be fun to do screenshots of spend like to automate this in some way where you could do a game where you could like buy click on it to identify all the things that are wrong <laughs> this sounds like the least fun game i can imagine <laughs> right? it's like an app on your iphone you play with your friends it's like a uh, flashcards of spam emails and who can identify it as spam more quickly or something yeah. and then you turn it into mechanical turk and it use it as a filter i think this is great yeah exactly i that's a gr I, this is the thing i think we can i want to make a service where you just like forward your email to because like my clients forward it to me i don't want to get these emails anymore <laughs> is this real it's like now i have to look at it how about you forward it to is this real email detector.com or something and like it uses AI probably, but also the kind of thing that you're describing where, you know, it, like a real human on the other end is a game that like a person <laughs> is looking at and saying no fake and it gets better at learning those. And also we should be benefiting more from the spam filters like Gmail has a massive scale. And if a million people are all of a sudden getting the same email, you supposedly better your password. It's unlikely that 10,000 people have to change their password right now. So, yeah, I don't know. Maybe they can get better at filtering that out and recognizing the things that are identified by somebody as spam and revoking them from the inbox or something like that. I go through this with my clients where I'm explaining if the message is legitimate, but you still don't want to see it, yeah. it's from, to your point, your local grocery store, it's from even some big company that, you know, you bought something from and now they're sending you their newsletter because you actually probably opted in, then do unsubscribe because it's legitimate and they'll honor that request and then you just stop it from coming in in the first place. But like to your point in the article also, you shouldn't click unsubscribe or whatever other links in a phishing email. So if it's not legitimate, if it's from some <laughs> scam company, don't click those. So there, again, all this doesn't sound that subtle saying it out loud, but like to my clients, I think they're kind of, I don't know, that sounds complicated. I have to determine if it's legitimate but unwanted versus just that there are they're already clicking stuff they shouldn't be clicking. I don't know. It's tough. I don't know if there's any hope. <laughs> I think there is some legitimacy to some of the services that do train users, one of them being no before, but there are others out there as well. I have found, at least personally, that where we put this out there to our clients that sign up for it, they're actually on the lookout now more than ever. We still get the forwarded emails like, is this real? Those kinds of things. But right. at least they're actually doing it more. And they're looking for email headers. If they fail an assessment or if they fail a legitimate phishing campaign from no before, 
then we're alerted and they have to go through an additional training and then they're like all embarrassed. But <laughs> I, I, yeah, I have to go back to a driver's ed class or something like yeah, exactly, that. Or like a, exactly. Well. You got two points on your license. <laughs> but I think there's some legitimacy there to help train them because it, it keeps them on the lookout if you keep them be, making them aware of it on a regular basis. Yeah, they don't want to be embarrassed in front of you either. Let, you oh, know, yeah. forgetting about what could go wrong in the world of tech, they just don't want to be called out for it. I think that could be really good. But it's troubling because, as you say, we say don't click unsubscribe and or don't click anything in phishing emails, but do click it in real mails. And like, actually, speaking as someone who runs a mailing list, please don't mark things as junk. To right. get rid of. Right. All that does is corrupt everyone else's send deliverability, and that's a really common problem. I have this one subscriber, Tibbet subscriber, an elderly woman, and I'm not sure what client she's using offhand, but she says the like the report junk button is like right next to the delete button. Okay. She clicks it once every three months. <laughs> <laughs> we have, oh, we just have conversations all the time because I have to go remove her from the Amazon SES suppression list and to get her back in. She's very oh. nice. She's very apologetic every time it happens. She even knows when she's done it now. <laughs> <laughs> but, but so yeah, it's just a little too easy. And this is this is trouble. This is one of those things where, you know, the world has gotten less and less pleasant, and it's a com- constant arms race. That I'm sure that Google is has entire teams that are constantly running statistics on incoming mail, trying to figure out the commonalities and what the likelihood of false positives are if they put in this new. Oh, you we mentioned someone mentions Google in the thing, but it's not actually from Google. What's the likelihood? Yeah. So. Right. It, it's got to be just a nonstop battle. And then, of course, the fishers, the spammers, they can just like throw stuff out the wall constantly. Yeah. And because they're doing it to every email provider out there, what do they care? If it stops yeah. working quite so well, oh, not a big deal. That They've probably got, oh, I made 25 bucks today. That's good enough. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's ah, very frustrating when you get into these situations where the financial rewards are asymmetrical for doesn't have to do very well for them to be happy with the cost. Yeah. yeah. And, and a lot of this does go back to the kind of basically design principles of email going back. How many years is it? Decades? 40, 50? I don't know how many years it is. <laughs> yeah. Where going way back, so encountered clients not that long ago, like on the order of five, maybe 10 years ago, who had four character AOL passwords because it was just grandfathered in and like never forced to change. I'm sure that's not possible today. Like they probably would have at some point required a password change, but it's still in my memory from having yeah. encountered that. And that goes back to the early days where there were either weren't passwords, there was just a level of trust or very basic passwords. And that's just not tenable today. And likewise, email in general was like, oh, just tell us who it's from. We're not going to check. So yeah. and spoofing from headers is like very trivial, although now you have DKIM, SPF. I guess going back to what I was saying earlier, like the mail client should validate all this stuff. I think that would require probably SMIME, right? It's not trivial to set that up either, to have a signed email to validate that it's actually from the person that was in the from name and that kind of thing. That's the goal of all these kinds of things. Email is so old and so simple, really. And it has to be because the concept of changing SMTP and all that is just unimaginable. And that's partly why thing after thing keeps coming on, oh, this is going to kill email. Nothing's ever going to kill email is the problem. Right. It's like the cockroach of the internet. I've never very, heard very... that before, but that's so appropriate. That's so <laughs> true. Yeah. It reminds me of Microsoft's kind of attitude of backwards compatibility. Like they never break backwards compatibility ever if they can help it. And it's yeah. so to the point where you'll see those underpinnings of Windows to this day that are low resolution <laughs> interfaces and things that still exist because some random corporate client still needs it. Whereas Apple's, your thing broke. <laughs> I guess you're going to have a busy weekend <laughs> You know, whatever. <laughs> but email is the ultimate like backwards compatible thing. How do you supersede email and still, I guess you have to offer people some better version of email. It's email 2.0, like web 2.0. And it's only people that sign on to this thing, have this ability to email you and for you to email them. And it, maybe we need something like that ultimately, because bolting this stuff onto the existing email infrastructure it does not seem to be working very well. All this stuff still slips through. So, you know, yeah. why? Yeah, that's you know. absolutely the case. And, and again, it's a little bit of the power of kind of a decentralized federated system that anyone can spin up an email server and start doing this stuff. But whereas if you're Google or Facebook or even Apple, you can just say, oh, here's you got to be this tall to play. You know, right. that Apple Apple does that all the time with certificates and things like that. But so when you've got this completely 
open system, it's well, also but with that history, it's not possible. It's yeah, yeah. No, I don't have any solutions there. And the only thing I'll say though is that I've had the same email address for forty years. Nice. Is that true? No, it can't be quite true. 30, 30 plus years. Because I had tidbits.com, it transitioned from tidbits.uu, so it was a domain that, that I moved from from the Unix to Unix copy approach. And and that was would have been in the very early 90s. That's very early to get into any kind of domain ownership. That's, yeah, uh, but the point yeah. being that I have a feeling that I probably get more spam than most people. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And to be fair, I, my, my email comes through Gmail. I don't use the Gmail web client at the moment using MimeStream, but I see very little spam. That the Gmail actually does a really good job of it. And my understanding is that the Microsoft 365 hosted addresses do pretty well there too. Yeah. And it was even um, probably 15 years ago where we declared email, running email a toxic hell stew <laughs> and basically said, do not run your own mail server. You cannot do it. This is something for the big boys. Yeah, Rackspace, somebody yep. reliable like that. Some, someone who is who has staff, d- multiple people on staff <laughs> exactly. to this 24-7. Anything else is just not feasible with email. Yeah. Because I had my own mail server. I ran my own mail server for years. And at some point, it's like, I can't do this. Yeah. You know? It's better to shift that burden of responsibility to someone who like staffs an entire department of people who are responsible for keeping the email working and also dealing with issues as they arise. And I don't want to be that person or even for my own email, let alone my client email anymore. The whole concept of scale there too, not only are you going with someone who's designing and building the infrastructure and really putting that effort into it that I can't put into it and supporting it, but also you're benefiting from the network effect or the sort of economy of scale of everybody else marking something as spam, for better or worse, like when somebody marks your valid newsletter as spam, it affects everybody. (laughs) A lot of times you do benefit from that and just Google's probably machine learning to also go one step beyond that to figure out likely spam in addition to what people are marking as spam. So yeah, a lot of benefits to doing that. One other solution that's really not even in the scope of email or find things is just getting people to use password managers because (laughs) the whole issue with this is that they're typing in personal info. Most people wouldn't give some random company their social security number or other info um, unless it had some kind of business purpose that they could like think carefully about. But passwords are different in their head. Most people are just typing in passwords all day long and in the habit of typing it in, if somebody says, I need your password, they just type it in. And so the issue is the typing it in part, not not any of the other stuff, not any of the tricks, but the fact that they're in the habit of typing in their password. Because as I tell my clients, one of the other major benefits of a password manager is the fact that the computer knows that you're on the valid site. The same site where you saved the password, when the password manager remembered the password for you, you're back on the same site and the password manager fills in the correct password. You don't have to look it up. You don't have to evaluate whether it's a valid request or whatever. You just let the password manager fill it in built-in one is great, one password's great, whatever. But that's the job they do. In addition to like storing the passwords, they figure out if it's the right place to fill it in and they fill it in for you. If it's not filling it in, that's your red flag. Why isn't it filling it in? Maybe I shouldn't go look it up and try to give it to them manually. Yeah. So that can really help, I think. Again, speaking to the outmoded infrastructure, passwords in general are really oh, not yeah. viable You've got to switch to pass keys. It's got exactly. to happen. Yeah. So I've been living this recently. I was a LastPass user. You'll notice Yikes. the past tense in there. Fun for you. Yeah. <laughs> right. And part of the reason why I was a LastPass user is for a very long time, long ago, LastPass was much better at autofill than 1Password was. I would... Just go to a website and boom, my username and password be filled. I could click login and I'd be done. Whereas with one password, I had to be constantly clicking something and selecting something and this is fussy. That's much less of an issue anymore. So obviously, LastPass had that huge breach and they actually just announced today a lot more details associated with that breach, which for anyone who's interested in security is fascinating reading. It's way too detailed. You're like Your eyes will glaze over at the details, but that's not the important part. The important part is like just how freaking hard this stuff is. Yeah. This is a company that was supposedly you know, like uh, security experts. And it's, A, they got some stuff wrong. They're pretty clear to say the actual problem that caused, really brought them down and caused the data to be stolen was a problem in a third party solution, which I thought yeah. was an interesting way of talking about it. Because, of course, this is LastPass. They write their own code, they have their own system. But 
for the rest of us, like none of us write our own code or anything. Everything we do is supposedly third-party third solutions. I'm not sure this makes me feel any better. The lesson is don't trust any third-party solutions. Then I'm jumping ship from everybody and just going with Apple across the board. Or Precis- yeah. yeah. So I thought it was a really troubling thing to to. They're clearly trying to like shift a little bit of the blame. You're know, like, right. oh, it wasn't yeah. us that did, did it. You, this was just a couple of days ago as we record this, but. They say the latest information I saw from LastPass is that an employee's home computer was hacked and their own corporate vault was taken. Wow. That is just unbelievable. But it's then just, also cracked somehow, like how just having the vault, they also had to have the password. Maybe they cracked the, the so keychain or something it's, else. Yeah, the, it, the stuff that they released today goes into a ton of detail about, because it was actually two kind of chained incidents. It was developers in both cases who were uh, breached. And the first one, basically, they didn't get anything related to customer data, what they got was some stuff that allowed them to target the second person. Wow. And then what the second person, what they managed to breach was, again, this is like slightly dubious on LastPass's part, like, oh, it's not our system. They broke the backup. They broke mm-hmm. into the, the, the cloud-based backup. I'm like, well, again, the rest of us have cloud-based backups. So we're concerned that is a that something that you could screw up. And so it was, it is telling. They take responsibility, but they're, and they're obviously doing a ton of stuff, but you do want to know, were you being lax before? Or was this, was like the attacker just really good? Yeah, because they're covering an actual situation like of accounts yeah. being compromised and people being targeted directly and all that stuff. They're covering it with just a bunch of fear, uncertainty, and doubt, which is just all too prevalent in this industry where now the result, to your point, is that people will not trust third parties and not trust online backups. And so then are we going back to the days of I'm just using sticky notes and I'm just, <laughs> and I'm just putting the backup in the fire safe, but it turns out I never actually do the backup. So it, there's a lot of downside to pushing people in that direction. And it's, it, yeah. And so, I don't know, it's very annoying that they would I don't expect them to be overly honest about it. Well, to be fair, I'm slightly emphasizing here that they're calling this out, I think, to separate their systems from other people's systems. But it's not a huge, oh, oh we were so not responsible. They're not doing that. So I don't want to I don't want to bias it too much in that direction. Uh, but, and they did it in this last batch of information. They were like very clear about what information was in the vaults and whether it was encrypted or not and things like that. So people had asked about secure notes. And the answer is, yes, it's encrypted. You can see, whereas like URLs were largely not encrypted, which was a problem. But they also yes. talked about what the customer sees as a quote-unquote vault is really data that's assembled from a variety of different systems. Right. So you've got a sense of their architecture. And again, like a little bit of how complicated all this is. This is not easy. Yeah. And we get into these systems where, you know, where AI is, of course, the ultimate one. We have no idea how AI works in the neural right. networks. These sufficiently complex systems, we don't really know how they work anyway. You know, yeah, that's true. Yeah. But at least it's decipherable until you get to the level of machine yes. learning. And <laughs> that's just literally like the people that are in that field say, we don't know yeah. how it works. And it's not like even facetious. It's just that's how this technology works is we don't know how it works. And the model trains itself basically. And then it just does the right thing. And we're like all pretty impressed with it. And we're just <laughs> like, wow, that's cool. But like they don't know how to tell you how it does that thing and <laughs> if it'll reliably produce that result. And it's also, I always have to, this is like the hobby horse I always talk about, but it's not that often, but it's capitalism. <laughs> it's the last pass is a publicly traded company and they have a fiduciary duty to their uh, shareholders to spin this story to make it sound like, hey, it's not our fault. So we, there's going to be spin in this because they they have to try to minimize the impact on their uh, their their shareholders, really. And they did this one, this batch of information. So they released the previous statement on December 22nd, I think it was. And uh, this batch is significantly more detailed because, in fact, one of the criticisms they took was they weren't sharing enough information. So people didn't know how to evaluate the severity of the problem. I do recommend it. You guys will enjoy reading it. Anyone yeah. who's listening to this show would enjoy reading it. Users, no, not so much. But it's it's that peek behind the curtain. And obviously, you don't get to see really what's behind the curtain, which has to be people running around with their hair on fire. <laughs> that would for be the last, a real you know, cool story to see. Right, last three months, I was. I have a little. I'm writing about this for tidbits. I like the little comment. Like the CEO, this Kareem Tuba guy, he started in April 2022. 
and the first mm-hmm. breach happened in August. Oh, wow. Can you imagine what this poor, poor guy. guy's life is like? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. What did I get myself into and probably didn't realize the level to which this was problematic? And yeah, <laughs> yeah. so it, it's a fascinating situation. And just to segue a little bit, it's not as though even Apple's immune from making security mistakes. Yeah, I would love to talk about this because I'm not so sure it's a mistake. It's a decision that they made that I think more people are not aware of in helping a client with, uh, they never know their password. You're connected remotely and you need the iCloud password for some reason and they don't know what it is and you just walk them through. Okay, go here on your phone, tap, <laughs> you know, settings, tap yeah. your name, tap password and just go ahead and tap reset password. And they're kind of like, oh, wow, okay. <laughs> oh, it's letting me put yeah. one in. Oh, oh, cool. And they're, they're asking the question in their head, like, why is this so easy for me to just pick a new password? Well, it's because you're holding a trusted device. So it's implicit that this is like you on your trusted device and you put in your passcode to verify that. But of course, the, the latest hullabaloo that you're alluding to, Adam, is the fact that now there's apparently like networks of criminals that are taking advantage of this fact by like just shoulder surfing your passcode. You type yep. your passcode in at a bar or restaurant or something. Swiping your phone, typing in your passcode, getting access, going into settings, changing your Apple ID, using that helpful function there to sign out every other device, including like your computer that's waiting for you at home and your iPad that might even be with you. And so you have no hope of undoing the damage. You don't even have a window of time, basically. They swipe the phone and you're out of luck. Yeah, um, they're doing this later. as they're running down the block away yeah. from you. They're, yeah. they're entering in that information as quickly as humanly possible to get you immediately locked out. And what's your take then? What should Apple have done? Should they restrict it in some way to say, okay, you can change your passcode, but you have to, I don't know, like what would they do? So there's a a simple one for the Apple ID password, which is actually exactly what Apple does on appleid.apple.com, which Mm -hmm. is you have to enter your current password before you can change it. Yeah. You know, that I realize well, that will make your tech support guys, your tech support lives a little the problem. Harder. Yeah, that's the problem. But, but, what, but the yeah. fact is, that's a that's a hole, a hole that's making life more convenient. Yeah, but then but the question the, is, how do you let someone change their password if they don't know the current password? Okay, you send them an email. Fine, they have the thief has the phone in their hand. You send them a text message. Same problem. You know, that, that the whole reason. So Apple makes it easy because. There's no difference between the illusion of security of you have to receive an email or you have to receive a text message. It doesn't matter. The phone's in your hand. It's already a trusted device. So why not just skip those phony security steps? But your Mac is not a trusted device. The web isn't. The web, iCloud, AppleID.Apple.com, but, is, I mean, your Mac is not. But you don't. But you can't do this. Yeah. Um, you, no, you can. can. Yeah, can? You, you can write in the Apple ID preferences and system settings or whatever. So use a strong oh. passcode. That's the yeah, answer. You are, you are correct. I just went in, yeah. in, in into the Apple ID settings on my Mac, and I can change the password just once on a new one, and I'm going to verify. It does not ask me for the old one. Correct. Yeah, it's, again, like, it makes sense logically because this is a quote-unquote trusted device, which could be used to reset your password. So why not yeah. just let you change the password rather yeah. than jumping through an extra hoop that actually doesn't do anything? So what would you do? That's the thing. Do you require two devices? But not everybody has two devices. What if you just have an iPhone? It's an interesting problem. This is definitely one of the things that, that they need to fix. And the other one, actually, is unfettered access to iCloud Keychain. Yeah. Because you want to talk pushing people to password managers. So not only does the thief immediately change the Apple ID so they get access to, they, they lock you out of your account and can do everything. They also um, have every other password that you've ever set and saved. Right Precisely. There. Yeah. Just sitting yeah. there. Yeah. And there's nothing you can do about it. They've already right. got the info and there's no remotely locking your phone at that point. There's nothing you can do. And the really simple answer of the thing you should do is use Face ID and Touch ID. Do not be typing your passcode in public, right. just like you wouldn't your, enter your ATM number with someone standing on your shoulder. And But here's a question. I have a friend who I can keep banging on on this like he's i don't want anyone knowing my biometric information he won't right. use face id yeah I'm like, i've had this conversation with clients too yeah. and i have to explain to them it's all on device and right you know, apple doesn't have your actual fingerprint <laughs> the device doesn't even have your actual fingerprint it has like an impression of your the mathematical representation and blah 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 
And it's like your fingerprint is already on everything else you've ever touched anywhere you go. So <laughs> what's the even which and so is your face. So what's and the right in your face? Let's face it. We didn't post photos to Facebook. Right. Your <laughs> right, face yeah, from that's every angle there. is out there. That to me these days, that's an easier one to bat down. The difficult one for me is the fact that if I agree with you here and I go ahead with your suspect advice about using a password manager, then that becomes a very highly targeted thing. Like then everybody wants to steal that password database. What's protecting that? And then I explain what's the Apple idea and the device passcode or the Mac password. So it's great. I can say that, but then LastPass is a major breach and it might make the rest of the industry look bad. So it's a tough one. Yeah. No, there's no good answer because every one of these scenarios has some problem, possibly until we get to passkeys. Maybe passkeys will have one once we start hammering on it for real too. Yeah. I know the theory, but I have not actually been able to use passkeys anywhere because none of the sites I actually use regularly support them. But that does feel like the eventual solution to, to all of this. And maybe, just maybe, there'll be something along the lines where Apple can say Face ID and Touch ID are important enough now that maybe you have to put them, you have to do them. They're not the, they're not the last resort, but they are used somehow in conjunction. So for instance, imagine someone steals your phone, and again, thieves could figure this out soon enough, but imagine that it's failing Face ID while you're, it's failing Touch ID when you touch the home button, right? So maybe there's some kind of timeout. Things get a little slower if you've just failed Face ID or Touch ID, particularly multiple times. Or again, I don't know if the I don't know if the Face ID algorithm has any concept of this, but if the failure is divergent enough, right? It's not just a binary yes, no, but it's there's the, oh, I didn't quite get his face right. I'm going to say if no. If it doesn't see a face or it sees a completely different face, then... Right. Then yeah. like it's a far, it's a far miss lock down, lock, slow things down, do additional checks, that kind of scenario. So don't let the passcode reset the Apple ID password at the, right. in that scenario, like require face ID and the passcode, maybe. Precisely. You can, you can say, because you can say, I need you to do more. You know, yeah. it's not going to be like, normally you don't have to do more because you've authenticated 20 times in the last 10 minutes and that, and it's all good. But wow, you just failed the last five checks. Right. Or and if you've detected that the person is running with the phone, then <laughs> lock everything yeah, down. Yeah. 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 So I think there can be some really interesting stuff here. And Apple's pretty good at this stuff, at least in theory. Like we see the like the crash detection stuff. That that was pretty cool. And they talked about how I think they were like I forget what it was they were. They're looking at a million variables or something to be able to determine whether a crash had occurred. And then of course it turns out that skiing and roller coasters fool it completely. <laughs> right. So, so you know, so sometimes I wonder if they're not just a little too clever. And it would seem that roller coasters you could geofence really easily. Yeah, exactly. There's not that right. many of them. <laughs> Getting a Can you detect little more... a fall while skiing? That's the real question. Wow. Yeah, that's a great <laughs> question, actually, because <laughs> You'd want it to, but right. there's a lot of things that probably look like falls when you're skiing. And I think you actually do fall while skiing all the yeah, time. So exactly. <laughs> at least I do. actual falls. Yeah. Sam, as your buddy who owns a restaurant, we haven't brought him up lately, but has he seen this issue with the Apple ID? The iPhone's being stolen right out of somebody's table. Yeah, he, he runs a classy establishment, Joe. Nothing okay. that <laughs> shenanigans is happening in his restaurant. I, I've mentioned this before, too. Speaking of somebody looking over your shoulder and seeing you type the passcode and then you're targeting, they grab your phone. I really try hard not to ever type, certainly my Mac password, which the keyboard happens to be facing up, which is probably in line of sight with a lot of cameras in a lot of locations. I tilt my screen down for good password typing hygiene. If I have to type, if for some reason Touch ID doesn't work, whatever, I have to type in my Mac password. I tilt the screen down so that it covers what I'm typing. The iPhone, I try to, I also try not to type it in a very obvious way out in public, not only just with who might be looking on, but again, cameras. If some camera at some establishment sees me typing the password, now this might be a little bit of like healthy paranoia or something. That's a threat too. Yeah, yeah it absolutely it is. Yeah. And I don't, I can't remember if the Wall Street Journal article mentioned this exactly, or maybe it was in the video, any event. But yeah, people have phones out all the time. It doesn't take much to surreptitiously film. Right. 
Can you say film anymore when you're talking record a video? It just, record <laughs> right. a video doesn't sound as good. <laughs> Take a video. Yeah, and you're right. You could just be standing there looking like you're on your phone and you're actually recording somebody's you know, typing on their phone and you capture their passcode. And once you know you've got their passcode, you can just walk by and grab their phone and leave, run away. That's how these yeah. scams seem to happen. And I did there. I think there was a little bit of, and I'm trying. To, it was trying to very much avoid this when I was writing about it. But there's a little bit of victim shaming going on. Like, how could you be so stupid to leave your phone out and things like that. And a number of those people, like they were just standing there using their phone. You can't. You if, so, yeah. if you're just holding this thing, someone can run by and grab it, and no one's going to be able to react to that. Yeah, but at the same time, we do want to build awareness. We do right. want people to be aware that if this happened. Somebody's standing there with their phone, and it just got swiped. And unfortunately, they, the per, the thief saw them type their passcode. So you really have to be careful with that. So it's the bordering between victim shaming and just public awareness of this stuff. There's nothing wrong with obviously using your phone, but right. maybe don't just leave it on the table. Yeah. That happens all the time. And someone was saying, yeah, like he sees people like in a coffee shop leave their stuff on the table and go to the bathroom. Yeah. Like. They're thousand dollar machines, yeah. <laughs> and, but they're but it is interesting because I was thinking about it, and they're so commonplace. We use them as users. We just use them all the time, which, on the one hand, makes them less valuable because it's not like this thing we go and sit in front of, and somehow it looks big and important. And similarly, everyone else is doing the same thing and treating them relatively frivolously, it seems. And so they don't quite have that. You don't get that sense of, wow, this is a thousand dollars sitting here in my hand. Also, I don't think people thought about the real threat of just even the iPhone giving access to their Apple ID so easily, no. not only giving access to it, but locking them out. And really, and Apple a deserves a little bit of blame there, right? Mm, because yeah. Yeah. quite legitimately, Apple has been pushing, saying, hey, look, activation lock is good. If they don't have the passcode, you can lock it down, all that kind of stuff. But they don't say if you don't have the passcode, but it's like the whole idea is you can find my, you can brick the phone, you can trace it, all this kind of stuff. So Apple's kind of saying, hey, we've got your back. Yeah. Except if they get the passcode. Yeah. And if that, they have your passcode, be all bets are off. And yeah. Yeah. But I, and I don't think people realized how easy that, that threat vector was to, uh, to exploit. That's no. the issue. And so people are frivolously just leaving things and using things and typing in their passcode and not really thinking about it. Yeah. And yeah, now hopefully they, they will be aware of this. One of the other articles uh, for the TCN subscribers this month was specifically about like how to protect your passcode. Yeah. Because I hope Apple does make some changes. As you say, if the ability to change the Apple ID passcode with a single device and not using email is important, it's going to be a little bit slower in coming. And in the meantime, people really have to get it through their heads that you must use Face ID and Touch ID and you must protect the passcode in if you have to do it in public. And it's possible Apple will even tweak because with Touch ID and Face ID, you're still asked to type your passcode periodically. And there's very odd rules for that. You can go look them yeah. up on Apple's site. It's 156 hours. You have to type your passcode at least once every it's like every six and a half days or something. It seems yeah. very well thought out in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. As you concluded that article in the Tidbits Content Network latest edition, it's a security wake-up call for people. Yeah. And I think that's really what the takeaway is. I think Apple can probably make some improvements and make this less of a concern, but it still should be a concern that it's like you wouldn't leave your car keys on the ground outside your house or even on a table necessarily if you were going to be gone for in a your while. car right in your car you wouldn't leave yeah your house keys the same thing just think about this passcode for your phone i know it's a short quick numeric thing for six digits for most people but it's really important that you keep that safe and you make it strong don't override the recommendations from apple and make it just all ones or whatever make it something that's unique and secure and make yeah. sure that no one else knows it besides the, you. the other one that that reason that kind of was said it was a wake-up call is in fact i'm reading this article article and I happened I saw it on a Friday Friday late Friday and so I started reading a Saturday morning and it was one of those things where you know Tanya and I are sitting at the breakfast table and I thought oh this is a problem we need to adjust what we're doing here not that we don't type our passcodes in we use touch ID and face ID all the time and things like that but one of the other ones that I hadn't really thought about was I don't use iCloud keychain but I have a lot of stuff in there just from years of using it. And it asks here and there and you save stuff. And I don't know what's up in there. And yeah. so I went and cleaned it out because I'm using 1Password now after switching from LastPass. And I know everything's in 1Password, but I don't know what's in one in an iCloud keychain. And I needed to clean that. Yeah. And similarly, they pointed out that the, the thieves, they get access to all your photos. 
Yeah. And that's an interesting point. We had a couple of stories come up. We put a call out to listeners and a bunch of stories came out in the Mac admin Slack command control power channel. Amy McKnight, for one example, shared a story that was something that happened to one of her clients where they, it was a really surprising situation where the thief basically sent a text message to her client of her client's ID as a way of saying, I have your stuff here. I have your info. Yeah. And at the, at in reading that story, it's like, what, how could that have been possible? Just how did this thief, like who happened to be sitting in this location with this person have access to their iCloud photos and had a photo of their ID in the photos? Like, how did they get into that? And I now in actually thinking about this in the context of the recent article that we've just been discussing, maybe it was something like that shoulder surfing a password basically and stealing a device or just typing in a password. But to your point, then you can do all kinds of things once you have access to this person's information and yeah. tricking them into giving up even more information <laughs> or maybe ransoming their stuff or whatever. It just all comes down to that basic security of keeping your passcode and your passwords strong and secure and just following good hygiene where that security is concerned. This is perhaps a little bit older, back before we had Touch ID or before all the devices did, that sharing a passcode was on the one hand a little bit, it was perhaps a way to show a level of trust. And so I think some people got into the habit that it was okay with people you trusted enough, which wasn't necessarily to say, like one of the examples I use, if you wouldn't give someone your bank account, you don't trust them enough. It was a little bit of the like the showing your new boyfriend that you trust him. Oh, yeah, my, my passcode such and such. Right. And Or the Seinfeld know, like, episode of George's ATM <laughs> classic episode. His, I don't want to give away the ending, but yeah, his password's kind yeah, of if funny. If you haven't seen a Seinfeld episode at this point, you can get yeah, That's true. Yeah. What a spoiler alert here. Yeah. His <laughs> password is Bosco, which I don't even understand how like a pass, password for ATM would be like a, a word and not a number. But he didn't want to give it to his girlfriend or anybody. And it's that's the whole basis of the episode. It's pretty funny, but it's true. And also, not only are you trusting that person, but it's about trusting that person's own security practices. Now that they're privy to this information, where does that information go? Are they, if they're saving it somewhere, are their systems secure? Yeah, All yeah, I can precisely. do is trust my own systems. I can't vouch for anybody else's. So as I was on vacation with my friend and at some point he, he said, oh, look at this. And he handed me his phone and it locked and it was locked. And he said, oh, his passcode is such and such. Luckily, I don't even remember it. But I'm like, <laughs> You really shouldn't tell me that. Don't tell anyone that. Yeah, that was and a test, and you failed. I was watching him, and I was like, "Why are you typing it in all the time?" And that was when he said he didn't trust biometrics. Yeah. Like, uh. yeah. And they were like, "And we're on vacation. I can't. Arg- I don't want to have a big argument with him or something like that." But I was like, "How do I say you're being a freaking moron?" Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's like a lot of the decisions people make about security. Ironically, they choose the exact wrong option for yeah. the wrong reasons. It's the same reason I have this conversation once a week still where clients, <laughs> I'm like, you know that thing from Safari, right? And it says, Safari created a strong password for you. Do you want to do the right thing or no? And they're like, I always click don't use. Well, that's the problem. You just need to click <laughs> use, the default choice. Just do what Apple suggests because that's all you literally need to do. But you just paid me a significant amount of money to basically tell you just to do the thing <laughs> that's built in. That you and- really shouldn't type your password as your dog's name every time. Exactly. So (laughs) it's just about building the right habits and disavowing people of these like crazy notions. The problem is Apple's going to have my fingerprint. Apple doesn't care about your fingerprint and they also don't have it, you know. Now, And I think it's also important to know that as we see, this is security, right? This is, oh, your iPhone and everything. But as soon as that becomes breached, what happens to the corporate stuff too? This is a big deal for businesses at the same time because... You know, that employee who has full access to your v- on your VPN, their phone snatched because they have bad pad, they weren't using face ID and whatnot, and suddenly your VPN could be compromised. Yeah, exactly. Right. And you can use the same argument with the residential client to say it's irresponsible to your family. It's like you're letting your family down, basically. <laughs> just use face ID and strong passwords. Whatever works at this point, honestly, I just think we have to help people do the right thing. And I hope some of these stories help people and some of the yeah. fear, uncertainty and doubt will help people as well, because it's just it, there as they've proven time and time again over all these years in technology, people are a little hopeless when it comes to this stuff. And and sometimes we just need to scare them into doing the right thing yeah. for their own good. And yeah, I think well, your article the, scored and, toward And on that. the one hand, the Wall Street Journal article and video are very well done. And I think they did a good job and it was important that they did it. The only slight problem 
is that they also just told a whole bunch more thieves how to do this. Yeah, exactly. Right. It really is a case of this. Again, the thieves aren't necessarily the brightest bulbs. But if this and this is big news, it really is something that, that the world just got a little bit more complicated than it was before. And it's not that there weren't thieves who knew how to do this, but there weren't as many as they're going to be now. But by the same token, now probably Apple also has to act. So yeah, yeah, all no. this stuff tends to, like you said earlier, be a little bit of a cat and mouse game. It, or it was definitely the right journalistic call to publish it. Yeah. It's not like they exposed some secret. Right. It's just not very well known outside of the tech support helping people reset their Apple ID password for all. And hopefully more people will now understand, just common people will know that this is a threat in addition to the criminals and uh, and do the right thing with security. Yeah, and thanks, Adam, for bringing awareness to both of these issues, really, yeah. just the prevalence of phishing emails <laughs> and the importance <laughs> of not falling prey to that, but also the issue with this vector to resetting somebody's Apple ID, which is a huge issue that our clients should be aware of. So I encourage listeners to go to tcn.tidbits.com to check out Tidbits Content Network and get those two articles, among many others over the years, that you can just basically send right out to your clients as is. And as I've said many times before, it's a great tone of voice that, that you use, and it's perfectly shareable with basically my entire client base. Great value there. Great content, Adam. And thank, thank you. you again for uh, for joining us on Command Control Power. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me. It's always fun to talk about this stuff, especially when there's been something that just happened. So well, sometimes you're like, you feel like you're beating the drum, but people are like, yeah, I know. And now you're like, no, really? See? <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> Wasn't exactly. making it up before. Jerry does his voices of customers of all kinds. Am I on the cloud? Joe spins his deeply detailed yarns all the time. I have a whole story about this. Sam is on the road again, phoning in from a hotel. At least we know where I am. Half a century combined of Apple expertise right now. Drop it.